Patrick Johnson covers the Canucks for the province and post media. He joins us now. How are you? I'm good now, Matthew. Thank you mm. for getting that read in nice and square. Mm-hmm. Forward. You wrote about Canucks culture this week, Patrick. Yeah. Uh, you know, credit, credit to the boss, Chappie, Chappie's <laughs> idea. Got to give him a shout out once in a while. Uh, yeah. It, uh, it's something that you know you hear these guys talk about stuff and we've had tyler myers around for five years we've had or six years we've had jt miller around for five years and talking points are always there we want to be better at these things you know we we talk about setting standards accountability all these things but it really does seem like they've actually gotten better at that and so i dove into that yesterday and uh tyler you know, one of these examples of how this works. You do this job for a while. You get to know these guys a little bit. They have some time for you. They're actually willing to engage with the questions. And, yeah, the accountability is there. You know, JT Miller talking about that as a group they've matured. It was something that stood out. You know, he noted we were a young team. We're not a young team anymore. I think he was suggesting sort of about how people operate at the rink and away from the rink and, um yeah, it's, it's a group that is understanding the next level. I mean, the, from a coaching standpoint, and I think I talked about this before, you know, there's that idea of sort of physical capacity, what you're actually able to do. But mentally, that's part of that's a that's a thing that a player, young players need to learn, right? Like, what does criticism actually mean? How does it actually play out? And and this team clearly has taken that on board. They've learned their lessons. They haven't, you know, I think it's true of many young players, no matter the generation, perhaps more now. You know, you need to learn and understand what criticism sounds like and what its purpose is and what it means. And I think this team is bearing the results of understanding that better. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because a lot of these young players, and you mentioned the young core, so it's, you know, Brock Besser, obviously Quinn Hughes, you know, you have guys like Elias Pettersson. They've, all they've done is won before yeah. they make it to the NHL level. So you're, you know, all you know is winning. And then you come here in the NHL and things aren't going so well. You get comfortable in your mind of what it's like to lose how much do you think that the growth of that has come into play where you know they're not they're not in that position anymore where they're they're winning games and, and they're playing consistent and things like that and kind of getting out from the norm of what was losing for so long for some of these guys well and i think a lot of it's you're, you're spot on first of all and i think a lot of it is understanding why it's not just that this feels bad but why does this feel bad and why what's happening to this and and this is, I think, in particular with this coaching staff, is, is there's an understanding, certainly from talking, but, you know, I mean, when I talked to Sergey Gonchar last year, you know, I think about the, the point he made about being able, even though if he's not always with the team, you know, being able to give feedback, like, here's a clip that I saw from the game last night, and here's a thing, you know, send it to players, here's a thing to think about. And that's bringing the, the sort of operation of that, of coaching, to the players in a way that they already operate, right? Like these guys are on their phones. Let's send them something that's on their phone that they can look at that way, right? Like, you know, it, it, it's 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 bringing a you know technology, bringing the the conversation to them to on on their terms, and and that connection clearly has made a difference. And and I think you're absolutely right. Like part of it too was just, do you want to do this or not? Think back to two years ago at the end of the season when Alvin kind of called out these guys and said, listen. You guys may be good, but you haven't done anything. Yeah. Let's go do something. Yeah. And and they and that's they're they're certainly trending that direction. Now the next challenge is can they make that happen in the playoffs? Well, look, uh if, if we're gonna talk about Canucks culture and the team maturing, I think the guy we absolutely have to talk about is the head coach. Right. And and the way he communicates. And I, I'm not I, I'm not sharing this to sewer. Travis Green, because Travis Green is on his second NHL job, and maybe we'll get the permanent job with the New Jersey Devils. And, of course, some of the particulars have grown up here a little bit. But one of the things I heard is that Travis used to be really hard on Elias and Brock, and they were sort of a little more sensitive, that it landed hard when yeah. Travis would criticize them, particularly in film sessions in front of the group. Um, as a caveat, uh, I was told, you know, like a lot of rookies, Travis went easy on Quinn Hughes at the start. And then, you know, a lot of the guys were like, just you wait, Quinn, it's coming for you too. And Quinn was of the mind, well, 
whatever he says couldn't possibly be as bad as what my dad has said to me over the years. <laughs> he yeah. has had hard coaching. <laughs> when Hughes had had some hard coaching in his life before he arrived with the Vancouver Canucks. I'm not sure Brock Besser early as Patterson had. Um, but the way Talkit has communicated to these guys, and perhaps more importantly, PJ, about these guys. Like, yeah. he has picked his spots with Pedersen. When it got too much, he he fed the beast, yeah. right? Yep, yeah, no, Elias has got to be better. Kind of reminded me of Al Avino all those years ago. You could ask him 10 times about Ryan Kessler, and he was going to pick his spot <laughs> when he criticized yeah. Kess yeah. personally because yeah. he knew how it would land with yeah. number 17. Uh, to me, Talkit has been the central figure in the changing of the culture. Is Is that fair? Absolutely. And the, you know, that how you talk to people is a skill in of itself. And and some of it you can learn and some of it you just got. And I think Rick Talkett just has it. Uh, it, it. I mean, like, you know, Travis Green's an interesting point. Yeah, you're right. Second job. We'll see how this goes. What did you learn from the first job? But, you know, Talkett, this is, I mean, technically it's the third time around as a head coach, right? First time around, probably totally in over his head. Yeah. Um, goes to Pittsburgh, learns how to talk. I mean, it, it play to your instincts, be who you are. And and you look at the people who are, I've spoken to away from the rink who played with him, just know him a little bit. I mean, Rick knows it feels like everybody who had ever been in the NHL, um, but a very personal guy, a guy who's willing to listen and talk to people and learn more about them. Um, and, and you're, you're absolutely right. Like a guy who figured out how to talk to players. He had the open door. He was the player in, or sorry, the coach in Pittsburgh, the assistant coach in Pittsburgh, who players would, would first go talk to. I'm having an issue. What do you think about this? They trusted his advice. He just has that presence. And I think he's self-aware on that stuff too, right? I think he's really worked at this and thought about how this works and tried to understand younger athletes. You know, they are different. They're different from a guy like JT Miller. You know, JT Miller is a millennial and, Quinn Hughes is a zoomer and there's a difference and there really is. And, and, you know, that was something, you know, JT was, we talked about, it's one of those ones where you talk a bit about it and he was, he was careful in his words and he made, you know, he wanted to make sure he got the message across, which was that, you know, that is one of talk at strength is that this is a guy who knows how to talk to different, not just different personalities, you know, in as individuals, but different personalities in terms of the way they've grown up and the way they interact with stuff. And, uh, you know, people Earth's age and my age and JT's age were used to being talked to a certain way, and that still grounds it in the younger generation. But the younger generation is different, and the way they understand the world is different. And so, talk it absolutely has connected, and he's figured that out. And you know, I mean, I think to, to Adam Foot when I talked to him before Christmas, he talked about that too. You know, his kids are the same age as those guys, and he had to coach those kids when they were, you know, 14, 15 years old, and he saw very early on how they how they interact with the world and how they take on things and in the end also there is a huge amount of credit to the players for sort of recognizing that they do have to come some distance to what the coach wants i think it is interesting that rick talkett talks about alex hodgins so much who's the mental performance coach of the team you know there's a really i mean his door is literally right outside the dressing room right like you walk down that hallway and there's the main door to the dressing room and then there's the side door to the dressing room and in between that is the x-ray room and Next to that is Hodgins. He's right there, and you can see his doors open. He's always there ready to meet with players, and they, they clearly take advantage of it. You mentioned culture. Obviously, we're, we're talking about that. Keep you know beating that drum a little bit, but JT Miller, he, you know, he's obviously grown up, I think, with so much of what he experienced early on in his career, and he even admits it about not being that professional, not being that guy, kind of getting lost in it in New York a little bit. He's 31. I mean, he seems like one of those wily veterans now that, you know, yeah. has seen everything and been through everything. He kind of reminds me a little bit now when he says things in the media. It's one of those Kevin Bieksa type of things where if they're not playing well, he's going to say something so he can take the heat of it because he knows what it's going to do to the room if it, if it spreads, right? Yeah. And and he, and he I think for him and for a lot of these guys, that's just shown the maturity of him and obviously this team. Yeah, and I think talk is a huge part of that too. Yeah. Right? Like, like clearly, Rick is the right coach for this personality, right? A guy who wants to talk, who 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 wears his passion on his sleeve, who got into trouble in the past for yeah. for for that kind of stuff, and talk it has 
basically said, listen, you want to yell about stuff, come to my office and we'll, I'll listen. And then I'll probably, I might yell back at you and then we'll be good. Yeah. You know, like that is, that is something, you know, you interact with them and, and, and JT will speak his mind and, and, you know, on and off the record and you have these conversations, then you move on. Right. Like he, he maybe in the past might've held a grudge. I think he does that less. I, I don't obviously see him really away from the rink, but certainly the, the, the narrative, the, the, the sense that you get as things advance that, yeah, this is a player that has, you know, in the end, he leans into his personality. He knows that, but he also, I think has found an outlet and that is his head coach. It's absolutely a, an essential part of the story this season. He goes home to West van. He takes rocks on the beach and he <laughs> squeezes them into dust. <laughs> yes. And then he's good. Huh? Yeah. I Pretty love, much. Those, love those relationships where you can yell at each other and then be good seconds later. Yeah. Ain't that yeah, right? you, those are the yeah. best. Ain't that yeah. right? Grady. Huh? We've gotten to that point. No comment. No comments. <laughs> All right. We got to that point a few weeks ago. In fact, Earth was there listening. It was quite a deal. I was just in the back. Yeah, I didn't even realize Earth was there, but he was screaming at me and I was screaming at him. And then I walked around the corner like, hey, hey Earth, guys, how's it how going? you doing? <laughs> Try and keep this in house, bro. <laughs> um, answer me the uh, Dakota Joshua. What do you make of him? Uh, we ex- anticipate he's going to line up with Miller and Besser. What do you think of that line? Because we haven't seen it. If at Well, all. I, I can tell you that, the, I mean, Dakota Josh, I'm sure, is excited to play with those two. The only the person who might be as happy as that is Farhan Lalji, who has been talking about this idea next to me in the press box for weeks. <laughs> um, I, I think it's really interesting. You know, Joshua has come so far as a player uh, and and has delivered on the promise that that, Canucks management thought he would be able to deliver on um, when they signed him from St. Louis. They, you know, obviously was, oh, he can penalty kill and he's got some sides. We think it's interesting. You know, he has, he has worked out as well as any signing, any player acquisition they've had. And the, the idea that he could really become that big bruising winger that, uh, you know, you know that JT Miller would love to play with and Brock Besser would love to play with. You know, for, for as a four checker, we know what, how important he was on that Bluger Garland line uh, before he got hurt. And yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm really interested to see how it works. I think this this line plays heavy, tough minutes. Um, Joshua has been an outstanding two way player, and I think he will add everything to that line. Keeps a stick on the ice. You know, he knows he's ready to shoot the puck when the puck comes to him, but he also knows that's not what he's there for. And uh, I, I think he really is going to add an interesting element to this line if it works out. Mm. We, uh, we're we in the final stretch before the Stanley Cup playoffs. And as you know, once we get to the Stanley Cup playoffs, everything is under a microscope. And so we'll be talking about, you know, the way that puck bounced in the middle of the second period leading to the Joshua goal or whatever. And not as much about the offseason business. So we're asking that here today, especially with Joshua returning to the lineup. If the Canucks have to pay market price for one of their free agents, Patrick, UFAs, which one are you which one are you paying market price to? Bluger, Ronick, Joshua, Zadorov. Feel free to go off the board if you'd Oof. like. Um, I think it's probably Joshua. I think just to, just just because of the growth and the player that he is. I get Ronick, like that's a tough one, but that's also a lot to pay for a guy that I mean, I, I still think you can find a defenseman that could play with uh, Quinn Hughes, um, but Ronix that that is the other one that I would consider. Um, I think Zadorov will excite somebody more than the Canucks could afford. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, you know, Bluger I think has been great. I've been really, really great. But that is the kind of center that you need to be smart about because you know the he is a depth guy and you don't want to get too enamored of your depth guys. Even if they are useful, you can always find a new depth guy. So I, I'm going to go with Joshua just because of okay. everything we've seen. Okay. Can I, uh, can I challenge you on follow-up on where, always. You, where, where will you, where you would find the guy to play with? Hughes I don't know. I, right I, this is why six. I'm not in management, but uh, yeah, I get that. I just, I just think I, I'm looking at the cost of the player. And obviously, Joshua is not going to be as expensive as Ronick. And I think the cost is something Fair. that's really important to us. Let, let me put uh, this to the group because I, I see, uh, I have seen others in the market are are asking this as though they are akin. But because I don't see it, but I'm open. I'm open to the case. Does anybody think 
Chris Tanif is an equivalent to Philip Ronick if they can't get a deal done with Ronick that you go pay Chris Tanif to come back and play with Quinn? I don't think Perf. so. I, I just I, I don't see the I don't see them wanting to pay fifteen million dollars over three or maybe maybe more than that for a guy like Chris Tanev. I mean, you look at Ronick's numbers in the first half of the season. I mean, he was putting up ludicrous points. Chris Tanev just doesn't do that. I mean, I know he's he's a stay at home defenseman and, and he's a guy that makes you know things pretty 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 easy for for a guy like Quinn Hughes. But um, I I do believe it's Ronick for the market value. I I think that you know they're gonna have to buck up. I just don't think that you can pay Joshua three million bucks or Teddy Bluger two and a half or whatever mm-hmm. it is. There's those are the guys to your point, PJ, about going to find a guy to play with Hughes. There's tons of those third and yeah, fourth line guys sure. that you can find around the National Hockey League. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think yeah, uh, Peach on ta- on Tanif as a fallback plan B on Ronick. If you yeah, and I mean it's just, you know like I take. Earth's point is exactly that. I mean, in the end, what is Joshua? Is Joshua going to be a first liner or is he going to be a third liner? And if he's going to be a third liner, you're absolutely right. I think the equation changes. Sure. I, I, I know. I, I think Tana would be a great story, but he, you know, he's coming. He, you're playing him as a, you know, a five, four, five, six guy at this point. Um, I think he would look good alongside Hughes, but he is not the producer. He is not the, the player. The key to that pairing has been their ability to move the puck up the ice. Mm-hmm. And and Tanev's good at that, but he's also a defensive defenseman. That is what he is at this point in his career, and that that pairing has not been conventional, right? Like it's been about puck possession and let's play with the puck, and that's the best way to defend is not to let you have it. Um, and Tanev obviously can play that role, but I think his primary purpose has been forever just to stop you. And, yeah, yeah, and he'll be. 35 before yeah. the midpoint well, that's it. next you know season as well, I, I so. you know it, it, are you i think he would make sense is he going to be you know are you keeping ian cole or are you going to go for chris tana you know what i mean like that to me is the question there so if mm-hmm. you're if you're not keeping cole and you need to replace that role then tana's perfect for that yep great stuff buddy thank you uh for the conversation we'll catch up next week great to see you guys Hey, everybody, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Sakaris and Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.